What's up, Meta Nerds? For this complete breakdown, we'll be comparing the Marauder to Clone Wars and Imperial Vessels, taking a tour of its interior and looking at its strength and weaknesses. Let's start with its manufacturer, Cygnus Spaceworks, who made most of the military shuttles of this era, from the new Theta, Sentinel, Eta, Alpha, and later Lambda. And the company even played a part in the stealth craft turned flagship for Tarkin, the Carrion Spike. The design includes cues from the new class body, with a wing style closer to the Theta and Eta. And although there are no official stats for the Omicron, we can deduce a lot by looking at these ship siblings. In this battle, it appears to be about 1.5 times the new, so around 30 meters long, and a height from the lower wing to the tip being around 37.5 meters, which would make it second only to the Sentinel class in size, and you could stack a couple ATTEs up next to it when it was docked. One of the first modifications of the shuttle is the speed. Stock, I would put it around 1,000 km per hour, since most of these are around 850, meaning it would match the Sentinel, while there are things like the Theta used by Palpatine that hit 2,000 km per hour. So as ridiculous as it sounds, the Marauder might be quicker than a TIE Fighter, and we get a glimpse of this when it separates from the Invulnerable. Just look at how agile it is at flipping over and racing away. So I think around 1,500 km per hour in this heavily modified version. And speaking of TIEs, this is the only shuttle like it that works in heat-radiating panels into these massive wings like the TIE line of fighters. They probably went so large with these wings because of that souped-up ion engine, because when you throw that in with the weapons and shields, in a shuttle of this size, the power generator in this thing must have had it running extremely hot. The ship is classified as an assault shuttle, and packs two front laser cannons and a powerful aft laser turret, which was perfect for their usual mission objectives, which hoped for a more stealth approach while being capable of blasting their way out. Like the ARC-170 and Ghost, having a dedicated gunner that can clear away tailing enemy craft is such a useful force multiplier, that even though it's just a normal strength cannon, this placement and ability to hop in and take control makes it so much harder to pursue or shoot it down. The Omicron class was rare, but not so obscure that nobody ever heard of it. Uh, looks like a modified Omicron class attack shuttle. This clone does work the impound, so he probably has a higher knowledge of ships than most, but that means it isn't some one-off custom ship designed for this top secret military unit. Clone Force 99 is such a secret that even Rex, one of the most prominent clones and the second in command to General Skywalker, who was himself the most beloved general of the war, even Rex doesn't know much about them. So why haven't I heard of this squad? Experimental Unit Clone Force 99. The defective clones with, uh, desirable mutations. 99, eh? Huh. Nice touch. This nice touch was the homage to their fallen brother 99, who died in the heroic defense of their homeworld, Kamino a man seen by his own creators as a useless failure and perversion of their genetic program, but was seen as a beloved brother by all clones who heard the story of 99. I know you work with Cody sometimes, but who do you guys report to? Hmm, good question. Can't say I've got an answer. So while we're surprised that Rex is out of the loop on anything, this is a nice look at the structure of the Grand Army of the Republic as Cody is higher ranking, a CC or clone commander, with a specialized genome and training program from birth for his role as commander, while Rex is just a CT, or clone trooper. And it's just a testament to his incredible willpower and uniqueness that allowed him to fit right in and be respected and often deferred to by force-wielding Jedi generals and enhanced CCs. When the ship lands, we see that signature Cygnus wing folding, and the landing gear that extends is standard, with running fog lights that we can see are always on, but can be increased to act like headlights, like that main one towards the front. These experimental clones have no respect for the reg's flight control or landing protocols, screaming into Ford and Axis and scattering crates everywhere. And later, you get a good look at the footprint of this massive craft on an Axis base. We see that it can be piloted by one person, and that these control panels were used for navigation to slice up space into grids, and were mirrored for the co-pilot. While the rest of the panels can display everything from local space orbits to hollow web surfing, with its powerful long-range hyperwave transceiver that could reach out across the entire galaxy with this faster-than-light means of communication. The gonk on board was from his own bad batch of droids. I'm fixing it. You can't. He's a defective unit. Hunter. Uh -huh. Don't worry, we're defective too. Gonky here provides additional power, and by having it not always plugged into the ship, you could hit the Marauder with an ion attack that disables everything, but then still run things off of this portable generator, or plug it into the ship after this attack to get some systems back online. We see it used to power up shields and get engine systems back up after being peppered by V-Wings. But since it was now plugged into the ship, when the Marauder gets hit some more, those balls of plasma are dispersed across the shield, and that electricity does start to transfer to the ship itself, and everything connected to it. Shocking Gonky, just like we see with other droids like Chopper. 
When not in the heat of battle, it can be used as a table for board games, a second hand to hold your tools, and most important of all, it turns the ship into a gym, being a full body workout device. The main body of this ship has these crash harnesses, and shelves and storage spaces that Wrecker would use like a bed, with more storage and perhaps the beds for the rest of the Bad Batch up top, which all sounded like a dream to a young Harrison Dula. You get to live on a starship? That's my dream. When the boys decided that Omega would become the newest member of the Bad Batch, they turned the turret into her room, with the latter making it feel like a big bunk bed or even treehouse vibes, which shows these guys were new parents, because she had her own separate escape door, with this hatch that opens up below the turret, something that did prove useful in escaping from the Zygerians. The interior is filled with all sorts of artwork, from Republic military victory propaganda posters to pinups, and a bunch of ads for blasters straight out of the Blaster and Tabana magazine, and even a relatable I Want to Believe poster. Like all starships, the fine controls for space travel can be used to hover in place, which when combined with these winches, they can drop down into deep caverns, as the cables seem to go on for at least several hundred feet. And you could imagine this being used to lift up or move around cargo, and even lighter vehicles like speeder bikes. It also provides a stealthy way to deploy or rapidly evac if they use something like the Skyhook technology. We see the Marauder going to all sorts of hostile locations, from dangerous environments to deadly locals. Side note, comment what you think of this. My intel says the Poltecs worship flying reptiles. These Poltec dragons look a lot like the form the Brother takes, and I think it might point to an idea that's explored in some of the expanded universe, that some populations' religious ideas evolved from the sighting of these powerful, force-wielding family members, the father, brother, and sister. As the Darksider was going to and fro across the galaxy, their Poltec ancestors saw this dragon creature do something incredible, and that memory was forever enshrined in their religion. Comment down below what you think of that. But back to the ship, Tech has an excellent idea of hitting the chain code problem head on. When he learns that the Empire is using a blockchain sort of technology to track all people and objects across the galaxy, instead of trying to evade this, he gets in early by registering it with fake details. But those details are now enshrined in the blockchain from then on out, and would appear legitimate. A great idea, even if this method of letting the imps impound them was a bit too risky for Hunter, and their escape did result in the barrage of fire that resulted in a lucky bolt hitting a capacitor. One of our capacitors sustained damage during our firefight with the rigs. When they work on repairing it, they have to contend with Ordo Moon Dragons, which lived off of raw energy, and would consume power systems and ships like the Pilot's Bane, the Minox, that were hated throughout the stars for their similar appetite. Many crucial systems are right behind these panels, making everything easier to reach and repair. These signature keys should be embedded below the rear parallax inverters. Ah, ah, just, just tell me what to rip out. And since Tech was the one who knew the ship inside and out, he felt like he was closer to her than any others. Rekka, easy with my ship. Your ship? And his expertise is able to scramble their signature. They know that credits can make sure you aren't even scanned, as long as you avoid major Imperial ports or automated scanners at more heavily trafficked locations. But by making use of criminal elements, you also expose yourself to bounty hunters. And when trying to run from the Empire and the likes of Cad Bane, their luck was sure to run out eventually. Over all these different missions, we see how scratched up and tarnished the exterior of the ship is getting, with this patina forming on some material, a corrosion of a copper alloy that is making it have these patches of blue-green. There are 14 different types of popular copper alloys in the galaxy far, far away, used in everything from ship armor to jewelry and statues. So it'd be interesting if this is pointing to a rarer alloy used for some superior stealth or heat-dispersing capacity. That's it for its breakdown. Can't wait to see more of it in action in Season 2. But as for behind the scenes facts, we've actually seen this ship since 2014, when the unfinished Clone Wars episodes were revealed. And this part was cut, perhaps deemed too racy, as it's one of the most obvious changes from what we eventually got in Clone Wars Season 7. Yeah, she can negotiate with me anytime. <laughs> Back then, the ship was called the Havoc Marauder, and the name was meant to just be dropped to Marauder, but the Havoc part was slapped back on for the booklet Ships of the Republic and Separatists too. Since there's no official stats on this book, I would point you to these resources, which are in the description, if you want to read up more on ships in general. Hit the like button, comment, and share. All that stuff helps out with the algorithm. Make suggestions for future videos, subscribe, and check out the membership if you want to see more. But most important of all, remember, there's never a time when you don't need a gonk droid. And the Force will be with you. Always.